Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Double Toronto launch of Personal Attention Roleplay by Helen Chow Bradley and The Good Arabs by Eli Tarek Al Beshalani Lynch. Um, we're really excited to uh, have everyone here today and tonight. Thanks for uh, joining us from wherever you are joining us from. <laughs> Um, I, my name is Ashley. I am one of uh, two co-publishers of Metonymy Press. Um, just uh, want to give another little minute to, as people come in to make sure people have a chance to join the webinar before we formally get started. Um, but I'll mention a couple things in the meantime. We are live streaming to Facebook and there is live captioning happening. Um, thank you, Kay, for doing live captioning. If you aren't seeing the captions and you'd like to see them, you should be able to um, adjust that in your uh, subtitle settings in, on Zoom. Um, OK, OK, OK. And can I just get a double check from panelists that everyone's hearing me and seeing me before we formally get started? Perfect. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Like I said, I'm my name is Ashley. I'm with Metonymy Press. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for being here. Uh, the two authors whose book we're launching, books we're launching, um, Eli Tarek El Bishalini Lynch and Helen Chow Bradley, as well as we're joined by Kaysan Sharp and Cha Ching Wilson Yang. Um, thank you to Kay for doing the captioning. Uh, we're also co-presenting this um, event with another story bookshop, um, which probably a number of you are familiar with. They're a fantastic store based in Toronto. If you're not, check them out. Um, yeah, they do a lot of incredible work to support authors like ours. Um, and in the past couple of years, all the while uh, working to keep their staff and their customers safe, um, not an easy thing during the pandemic uh, running an independent bookstore. Um, so do uh, check out the store either if you're in Toronto or online, all of the speakers who are with us this evening have books available and um, we'll be sharing links to how to order those books. Um, yeah, so uh, some of us, uh, myself, um, my co-publisher Oliver, who's here, um, and Eli and Helen and Kate, uh, likely some audience members as well, are uh, joining you from Montreal, Lunyang, Jojage, um, unceded Ganyangahaga territory. Others uh, are based in Toronto or to Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Um, wherever you're based, we do encourage settler audience members to make active efforts to learn about the land uh, on which you live and to find ways to support Indigenous sovereignty struggles happening, whether close by or throughout Turtle Island. Um, I'm not going to talk much longer before passing things over uh, to our um, host this evening, Jia Ching, but I did just want to introduce all the presenters before I do that. So. Um, yeah, Jia Ching, uh, who is also a metonymy author, um, is mixed race trans uh, writer living in Toronto. She writes fiction and poetry. Uh, her work has appeared in Rue Magazine, Bound to Struggle, and Letters Lived, Radical Reflections of Revolutionary, Revolutionary Paths, which was edited by Sheila Sandbach. Her first novel, Small Beauty, I uh, received a Dane Ogilvy Honor of Distinction for Emerging LGBTQ Writers from the Writers Trust of Canada. Um, she's working on upcoming works of short fiction and a second novel as well. 
Thank you, Jiaqing, for being here. Um, we're going to, we are privileged to be hearing uh, reading and discussion also from Kaysan Sharp, who's a writer based in Toronto. His work has appeared in Canadian Art, CMAG, uh, Public Journal, and Brick, among others. Um, he is named a queer writer to watch by this magazine um, and has presented work at the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Vancouver Art Book Fair, the Prairie Art Book Fair, and the Hamilton Film Festival. His first collection of stories, Our Lady of Perpetual Realness, uh, was published by Metatron Press in 2017. Um, stars of the Night, Helen Chow Bradley is a writer and musician living in Jajage, Montreal. Their writing has appeared in Carte Blanche, Cosmonauts Avenue, Mezenev Magazine, Montreal Review Books, and elsewhere. They're the author of Automatic Object Lessons, a poetry chapbook, and the fiction editor for this magazine, as well as the host of Strange Futures, a speculative fiction book club. Personal Attention Roleplay is their first book. And finally, uh, Eli Tarek El Bashalani Lynch is a queer Arab poet living in Jajage, unceded Ganyangahaga territory. Their work has appeared in the Best Canadian Poetry 2018 anthology, Guts, Carte Blanche, The Shade Journal, The New Quarterly, Arc Poetry Magazine, and elsewhere. Eli was long listed for the CBC Poetry Prize in 2019. You can find them on Instagram and Twitter at the only Eli Tarak. Their book, Not Body, was published by Metatron Press in September of 2020. I was going to say last year, but that's not true anymore. And The Good Arabs is their second poetry collection. So, uh, yeah, thank you everyone for being here. I'm going to pass things over now to Jaching. Hey everyone. Oh God, let's take my fucking teeth again. <laughs> Welcome to the event. Um, my name is Jaching Wilson Yang. Um, I'm going to be hanging out with you all after the readings uh, to ask some questions of folks. Um, and I'm yeah, pretty excited to be here. I'm really excited about these two books. I think they're brilliant. And I'm gonna pass it over to Kaysan Sharp to start the readings. Talk to you later. Uh, thanks, Jai Ching. Um, my name is Kaysan Sharp. I'm a writer based in Toronto. Uh, you heard my bio. Um, thank you everyone. For having me tonight. Thank you to Metonymy and um, to Jai Ching for being here um, and conversation with us and to Kay for captioning. Um, and thank you to Eli and Helen for having me. Um, originally, Eli asked me to read at this launch um, in the fall and it was envisioned as a sort of in-person thing, um, but obviously there was other plans. Um, so, but I'm still happy to be here uh, and in this case, I didn't have to leave my apartment, so that's kind of nice. Um, I'm going to read a little excerpt of a work, a piece that I've been working on for a while, for about two years. Um, it's about Lana Del Rey and uh, her album, Norman Fucking Rockwell, from 2019. Um, yeah, and so I'm just going to read it. It's a little excerpt. Um, so here we go. I only wrote one thing this summer an essay about the spring. I sent it to Nabij and he said it was tautological. I thought it was a compliment until I looked up the definition. The saying of the same thing twice in different words, generally considered to be a fault of style. So here I am trying again. I have a problem with beginning. I never know where to start. The beginning could be anywhere, only identifiable in retrospect. And even once we think we found it, we can never be too sure of its truth. The beginning might be in Alexandra Park, Toronto, 1997. I take a butter knife and carve my name, which I've just learned how to spell, into the wall of what will become my bedroom for the next 13 years. Dad sees my handiwork and gets angry. We don't own this apartment, he says. The city does. We could start a block north in Kensington Market, where pit bulls run off leash and dad buys dried beans by the pound. Or we could start a block south in the fashion district, where discount fabric outlets snuggle the defunct garment factories that give the area its name. We could start with spicy Thai soup from the Java house, a delicacy reserved for when I'm sick. Or we could start with the punks on the corner of Queen and Bathurst, the ones who jiggle their tip cups after wiping a squeegee across the windshield of any car forced to a halt by a red. 
We could start with high school and its associated landmarks, a pair of wrought iron gates across from Castle Frank Station, a dance teacher's promise that only a few of us will make it, the look on dad's face when he finds a pale pink copy of that magazine at the bottom of my dresser drawer. We could start in a room under the stairs in an apartment under the Dakari Expressway, or we could start with a stained yellow jacket lined with brown wool, bought secondhand and worn for seven consecutive Montreal winters. We could start with one of several gigs, dishwasher, window washer, telemarketer, stock boy, grocery cashier, warehouse clerk, office assistant, traveling salesman, freelance copywriter. Or we could start with Our Lady of Perpetual Realness, a chapbook of stories published two years ago by Montreal's Metatron Press. Any of these beginnings could be used in full or in part to answer the following question. How did I end up here in a room too small to fit anything other than a bed with $10 in my bank account and delusions of being a writer? A few walls over, Tommy constructs a bed frame while Neve sits by the living room window watching the activity along Dundas West. We're looking for a fourth roommate, someone to replace the German sublet we had over the summer. Roger says he'll send an exterminator sometime next week to deal with the roaches, the ones that keep crawling into our shower from the cafe downstairs. It's September, Virgo season. Is this a place to begin? I had plans to write about Norman fucking Rockwell, the new album by Lana Del Rey, but I don't have anything to say about it that hasn't been said more eloquently by someone else. Critics have applauded Lana for her clever references, her shifting personification, the way she creates LA as she reflects it in her songs. I'm jealous of songwriters, their ability to distill a narrative down to a single word or phrase. Goddamn man child, Lana Croon's first words off the album. He fucked me so good, I almost said, I love you. How's that for a beginning? Lana's a sense of pop royalty is as rightfully deserved as it is exhausting to watch and no one seems more exhausted by it than the singer herself. Last week, she took to Twitter to roast an NPR journalist who dared to shower her in more flowery praise. Her outrage over a critic's misinterpretation seems at odds with her lyrical strategy, which relies on the occasional reconfiguration of her own and other artists' words to suit her own purposes. But if projecting oneself onto Lana is an infraction, I owe her an apology. I've been reconfiguring her lyrics to suit my own purposes since her debut. Take the following memory. I'm crying while listening to Sad Girl at Student Services. Henry, my boyfriend at the time, has just texted me something offhandedly cruel. And there I am like an idiot, wearing his t-shirt on my lunch break. His Bonnie on the side, Bonnie on the side. That summer, I decided to become a writer by telling people I was a writer. I got away with it because I was 22 and living in Montreal. Consider it another beginning. Thank you. And uh, now I'll pass it on to uh, Eli. Hello, everyone. Um... I'm going to start by reading a piece uh, from the short story that's in my poetry collection, The Good Arabs, which is, looks like that. Because um, I figured since I was reading with um, a bunch of prose writers slash fiction writers that I would hop on board. Um, so this is called Do You Run When You Hear the Loud, The Sound of a Loud Crack. Mar Elias Church, 2040. The church is alive with Teta's wails and she leads us into our mourning. She's in the center of the first row and her cries fill the space, bouncing off the glass windows. I pinch the thin flesh of my wrist to help me hold in my tears. I haven't been to church in ages. My body is stiff and I try to move a little bit without sticking out. I rub up my shoulders that hurt more than usual as I try to stand tall and straight. I avoid eye contact with my countless relatives, their gazes filled with pity. Eventually, the priest starts chant singing. I sit three rows behind my teta, but her grief consumes me, consumes the church, clings to the walls, to the stained glass. 
becoming part of the architecture. If I squint and look at the light in just the right way, shining through the glass painting of an angel with its arms lifted upwards, I can see the dust particles, sense the layers of grief years old, hear the sobs of other tetas years ago, decades ago, many conflicts ago. My tetas wails join the priest's chants and together they make music. My younger sister Neshwa slips her hand into mine. I don't turn towards her, but the warmth steadies me a little. She cries softly, her body shaking. In the most recent round of killings, after the most widespread protests in the country, 65 people were killed, including five children caught in the crossfire. My Khalo, Teta's eldest among the dead, trying to help children caught in a bombed building. He did not survive the attack. Another bomb landing on that same building, exploding, shattering, killing anyone who didn't die from the first blow. Most of us don't believe the government. Their attempts to blame the deaths on the most prominent leftist rebel group, disillusioned as we are by decades of empty commitments to change. Government aid that never came, hospitals never erected, hungry mouths never fed. I look up and ache, my breath hard to steady. I breathe deeply many times to return it to its normal rate trying to calm my heart at the same time. Could one person's death be more important than those of hundreds at the hands of our government? Though the casket is empty, my Khalo's body unreachable under rubble, I see him in the gold dust and the sunlight leaking into the church, hear him in my tetas sobs. My Khalo is gone and so are his glistening brown eyes, his tenderness, his anger only unleashed when pushed his secret of life, his young years spent in the war. My Khalo is dead, and for today, I hold space only for his singular, for this singular grief. Tomorrow, I will grieve my country. I drift off when the classic Arabic of the priest becomes too hard to understand, the chants becoming background noise. My hand is numb in Najwa's. I haven't moved it enough throughout the ceremony. When the priest guides us to our knees, I return to my body and worry about having to get back up, my knees aching on the padded cushion. Everyone in the church bows their heads, but I keep mine raised watching. One of my second cousins is in the row to the left of mine, body rigid, back stiff. I remember the stories of how he mis mistreated my Khalo growing up, calling him names, questioning his sexuality. Staring at him, I don't realize everyone is getting up until Neshwa pokes me. She helps me up, notices my knees catching, but I shrug her off. Hard enough not drawing attention as the only queer person in the bu building. I can't stand receiving condolences, so I shoulder my way toward the exit, leaving Neshwa to tend to our mother. I push past everyone headed to the Azza. I avoid the looks on their faces. They probably think I'm rude for leaving. Something brushes against my arm, and I peer up to see a woman with dark curly hair, a loose headscarf, and dark brown skin touching my arm. Allah yirhamu, she says, and before I can look at her closely, she slips back into the crowd and disappears, leaving a scent of jasmine behind. Outside the church, the late morning sun shines, oddly red for this time of day. Shadi, who had been sitting a few rows away, follows me out of the church. Where are you going? The suit, I think. I need to walk, maybe pick up some fruit. Shadi tags along and we walk in silence for a bit. Do you wanna talk about it? Not at all, I reply. And he grabs my hand, stroking the top with his thumb. Suit. The cars kick up dust, but thankfully I have my sunglasses. I put on my brown leopard brow lines. Shadi, who is myopic, is safe from the dust attack. The day is hot and we turn into the market street. I take off my dress shirt, sweat so heavy it soaked the armpits and back. Shadi keeps his on and I wonder how he deals with the heat. His body seems less coated in sweat. When we arrive at the suit, we head straight to my favorite vendor, Yusuf. His eki dine are always the cheapest and I get a dozen since they're Tepa's favorite. 
I don't realize Shadi isn't beside me until I hear him screaming, Shahid! Ya zalame! He shouts even louder, trying to get his cousin Shahid's attention across the soup. I walk up to Shadi and elbow him. Just walk over to him instead of screaming. It'll be easier, you know. You don't have to come with me. You can just wait here. I won't be long. I know you're not in the mood to talk. It's fine. I'll be fine. Shadi raises his eyebrow, but starts walking over to Shahid, who is holding a bag of mishmash. How are you, Habib? Shadi cups his cousin's cheek in his hand, leans in, and gives Shahid three kisses. Shahid is in his early 30s, and yet he has deep bags under his eyes. His hair is missing small patches, and he shows signs of graying. He didn't look as worn out a few months ago. I also kiss Shahid in greeting and notice he's losing weight as I, chest, as I touch his waist. I'm okay, Shadi. Kifak inta. Shadi answers our questions with a word or two, lacking his normal enthusiasm. When he turns to me again, he looks more like himself for a second. I'm sorry, Mo. I heard about your khalo. Allah yirhamu. Thank you, Shahid. When I lost my father last year, well, it was one of the hardest periods of my life. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. His eyes glass over and he once again looks much older. I have never heard him speak about his father's death. He fidgets with the bag of mishmish, twirling it clockwise and then counterclockwise. I got this fruit for my mother. They're her favorite. I wonder at the change in direction, but then he continues. My father used to bring her mishmish every Friday. I guess I took over when he passed. He starts twirling the bag faster. I can feel his anxiety rising in the air between the two of us. And for a second, I forget Shadi is standing here with us. Shahid starts looking around furtively between the stands at his bike, then back at us. I ask, are you in a rush, Shahid? We don't want to keep you. No, no, I'm, I'm just a little dehydrated. I should head home before I get sunstroke. I forgot to bring water with me. Before Shadi and I, or I can offer him a bottle, he rushes away, jumping onto his motorbike and riding off. Um, and then the story continues for many pages. So if you'd like to know what happens next, you can read it. Um, some, some intense things ensue, so. Um, I'm just going to read a poem um, from my collection of poems. I figured that was what one should do. Um, so this one's called The Good Arabs, which is the titular poem. Hassan hasn't talked to me or anybody since the day of green seas, and we reduce it to absence. But they said it's a changing in the weather that signals more to come. And we're trying to understand, but this isn't a jump off the cliff move. It's not a change built over time. I can tell this isn't going anywhere I want it to. We trade in seas for lakes and summon the ancestors whose names we don't always know because family histories aren't always recorded. Maybe I need to jot down a list of names of everyone who's ever walked me home called when I was alone, ever told me I'm acting like my shit don't stink, because love is more than sweetness when you grow up in an Arab family, when you grow up any kind of working class. And any good Arab knows you need to strive for the top, for the change in cars every two years, for the kinds of capitalisms we never critique. A generation before ours ate their colonial shame tried to beg for mercy and only got a lesson in apathy. You get a car, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. But what about a lesson in our own histories, our own urgencies, our own violences? Any good Arab knows not to get too dark because who knows what could happen when you slip further away from whiteness and the view from the top of Mount Lebanon. Any step up is a step down for other people and yet. I'm saying we can't do the job right. The statue of Hadisa looking down with tears in her eyes, a miracle. But you're mistaken, my friend, Habibi. She isn't happy. She isn't well. Ya Rab, I'm not religious, but I see our reflections in her eyes and 
we're starting to look a little devilish. Thank you. Um, and next up is Helen. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I think this was mentioned before, but yeah, originally we planned to do this event in Toronto in person, and I am definitely sad not to get to see everyone face to face, but I'm, I'm still glad that we're able to do this. So thank you for being here and thank you to Kaysan and Chaching for joining us. Um, I'm going to read the beginning of one of the stories in my book. Uh, this story is called The End of Gods and Heroes. Um, and it's actually the first time I'm reading this one at an event, which is kind of fun. The End of Gods and Heroes. If they were flames, they were looking up the inside of the kitchen window. Knees locked from the cold, Tommy craned her neck, straining to see across the alley. The flames, if they were flames, flickered and billowed, touching the ceiling of Shireen's apartment. The sky was a blue-black void, the stars like shards of ice. If the flames that were maybe flames were touching the ceiling of Shireen's apartment, they were also reaching towards Shireen in her bed and the smaller Amiri's and Mr. and Mrs. Amiri. Tommy trembled on the fire escape, high above the icy ground, imagining the family engulfed in flames like the towering pyre that Heracles had built for himself when he was poisoned by the cloak of his jealous lover. It wasn't the cloak of his jealous lover, Shireen would have corrected her. His jealous lover procured the cloak from the evil centaur Nessus, who had soaked it in the blood of the Hydra. She was tricked. Also, her name was Dianira. Shireen's corrections were always pointed. She memorized the myths studiously, although Tommy felt them harder. To Tommy, their game was life, death, everything. To Shireen, perhaps, in the end, it was only a game. They had discovered the complete tales of the Greek gods and heroes in the neighborhood library that past summer, back when the fire escape was a friendly hideout, not a creaking metal tower swaying over the alley's precipice in the cold wind. In summertime, spiraling vines clasped the painted railings, a wall of tendrilled green full of tiny gaps to peer through. Morning glories bloomed purple and pink and blue before lunchtime and curled back in on themselves by afternoon, like the scrunchies that Shireen and Tommy wore. They wore them three at a time, one of the many codes composing their secret rituals, one in the hair, one on each wrist. They took turns borrowing the complete tales from the library, the card in the back and assertive pattern of their two names infinitely alternating. Shireen Amiri, Tommy Ogawa. Shireen Amiri, Tommy Ogawa. They crouched up there among the leaves for hours, spying on the neighbors in the back alley through binoculars made out of cardboard paper towel rolls discarded by their mothers. The binoculars were part of a larger, more complex game. They called it gods and heroes and could hardly remember a time when their every free moment wasn't devoted to it. They had studied the ancient codes of honor and courage, of quests and sacrifice. The back alley, a key landmark in Gods and Heroes, ran hectic with activity. They imagined it a roiling river between their two apartments, the terrible sticks which they read about with great attention. A boundary guarding the land of the dead, crossed only by ferry. Tommy had once taken a ferry when she and her mother had gone to visit Uncle Richard on Vancouver Island, where he lived with his girlfriend, Shannon, in a little house. The little house had a backyard with chickens who lived in their own little house. Tommy had loved the boat ride, had begged her mother to hold her up to the railing on deck so she could look for sharks. Not sharks, whales, her mother had told her. No, it's sharks, she had shouted. I saw one just now. She was sure she could detect the black and white sharks swimming below the water, their fins grazing the swirling foam, waving at her alone. She was younger back then though and didn't know anything. They had never gone back, even though Uncle Richard had promised to show Tommy how to kayak when she was older. It was too much fuss to get to the West Coast, her mother had said. 
Stop pestering me. You're always complaining about something. Go do your homework. Tommy, short for Tomoko, lived in a two bedroom apartment with her mother, Irene, which wasn't short for anything. Shireen lived with the smaller Amiris, Golnar, Farah, and baby Nader, and her mother and father, Mr. and Mrs. Amiri, even though their apartment were not so different in size. Everyone in Tommy's apartment slept in a room alone, in a bed alone. Everyone in Shireen's apartment slept in a room with another person, in a bed with another person. I can't concentrate over there, Shireen would complain. Everywhere I turn, she paused dramatically, arms and legs, crying and pooping. You're so lucky you have your own room to read in. Tommy secretly thought it would be nice to have a crowded house. Nobody, it seemed to her, was lonely over there. Nobody seemed sad for long. Not like on her side, where Irene's shifting moods created an unpredictable weather. Sometimes she made heaps of spaghetti and meatballs for herself and Tommy to slurp, and they laughed together at the kitchen table. On those nights, she would read Tommy a myth or a chapter from any book she wanted before tucking her in and kissing her forehead. But other times she could barely heat up a can of soup after work and would retreat to her room with her bowl. Tommy knew better than to ask for a story on those days. She would quietly take her mother's soup bowl from her after she passed out. Then she would wash the dishes, pretending she was Hestia caring for her hearth. She wasn't quite sure what a hearth was, but it seemed to involve, involve scrubbing. It was much easier to spend time with the Amiri family. Mr. Amiri would pat her shoulder on his way in and out from work, would absentmindedly ask her about her conjugaison. Mrs. Amiri fed Tommy tea with honey and delicious crispy edged rice and included Tommy in family duties like picking up groceries from Marche Pradeep down the street or carrying overflowing bags of laundry to the coin laundromat on the corner where Tommy and Shireen annoyed the other customers by trying to send each other through the dryer cycle. Mrs. Amiri handled the house full of children with the practiced authority that Shireen sighed at but Tommy admired. She made sure that the heroes included the smaller Amiris in their exploits. When one of the small siblings wanted to cross the alley, Shireen and Tommy would ferry them, piggyback style, but only if the timing was right within the game. And only if they paid in whatever currency was required. A handful of pony beads, five saffron threads, a sufficiently interesting rock from the park. If they complained, Shireen and Tommy told them that it had been this way since ancient times. A ride to the underworld was not to be taken lightly. The gods and goddesses were fickle, and as heroes, Shireen and Tommy had to work to keep their favor. When the Amiri's car got broken into and their car radio was stolen, the heroes scoured the neighborhood for evidence, arguing over who got to wear Mr. Amiri's sunglasses and scribbling observations in a spiral-bound notebook. When Golnar got bullied in gym class for crying during dodgeball, the heroes accosted the two offenders at recess and hustled them behind the big slide. They tied their wrists and ankles together with their long fluorescent shoelaces, spat in their faces, and wouldn't let them go until they promised never to mess with the small Amiri again. The kids told on them, and they each got detention for a week. They would have liked to sacrifice a lamb for the gods and goddesses' attention, but though they had eaten roast lamb plenty of times in the neighborhood, they had no idea how to go about it. There was something called a spit. There was a great bonfire. This they knew, roasting flesh, hides. But they couldn't quite envision the transformation of the soft-nosed animals they'd seen at the petting zoo into a mighty offering for Olympus. Instead, when they finally got let out each day, they swept obsessively at Shireen's house. We're clearing out the Augean stables, which have been mired in filth for 30 years, they shouted when Mrs. Amiri told them to stop spreading the dust around. She approved of their defense of Golnar, though. Family must protect family, she often said and shook her head at the detentions. You're good girls. You have a strong moral sense. Why punish this? They knew better than to sweep at Tommy's. Irene had already given Tommy a spanking for getting detention. What did I tell you about doing everything Shireen tells you to do? You need to learn to think for yourself for a change. Always running around trying to impress that girl and her family. 
What if you get suspended next time? Do you think I can afford to take time off of work? Of course she didn't understand. Who was Irene loyal to, Tommy thought. Nobody. She swiped one of Irene's lighters from her bedside table one evening when Shireen was over. They crouched on the fire escape and wrote secret oaths to their chosen deities and lemon juice, took turns holding the paper scraps over the flame to read. This was a trick they had read about in a book of science experiments from the library. The cruelest goddess were goddesses were best, Athena and Artemis, Hera and Aphrodite. The paper smoked and curled at the edges, its message slowly appearing in toasty brown. Shireen's handwriting was a left-leaning scrawl. Tommy's was painstakingly upright. She tried to make hers lean like Shireen's, but could never make it look natural, even when she wrote with her left hand like her friend did. Tommy lit her plea to Athena on fire by accident. She shrieked and flapped her arms. Let it go, said Shireen and the paper flew out of Tommy's hand and fell flaming into the vegetable garden below. I'll stop there, thank you. Let me invite everyone back to the stage. <laughs> Thanks for uh, inviting us back, huh? That's great. Thanks everyone for those readings. They were gorgeous. I love them very much. Um, so now I'm going to ask some questions in this panel style event. Um, and the first question that I have um, is about the covers of your books. Um, and you know, normally when we're at a reading, we get to see you know you reading from your book or Eli, you reading from your book whatever case, and I don't have yours, but I don't think you were reading from your book. Um, but I'm curious, this is, this is the cover of Eli's book. You can't really see it, um, but it's lovely. There's this nice embossing on it, uh, texture. This is the cover of Helen's book, also lovely. Um, and I can describe the cover of Kaysen's book. Um, there's, got, no, I'm, <laughs> there's kind of a red rounded border, uh, there's two sections and then a nice black line drawing of this gorgeous queer person with long hair and lovely earrings and eyebrows. Um, my question, <laughs> I just keep rambling into my empty bedroom, uh, <laughs> is how do you know what to put on your covers? I know when uh, we were trying to pick a cover for my book, it was a long and strange process. And we ended up with a very weird thing that I think is quite cool and not really related to the book. And you folks, I'm curious about what it was like for you. Hold the books up, says Oliver to hosts and panelists. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, um, how did these come I was to gonna you? say, I, I love the cover of your, your small beauty book. It was like, I remember noticing it immediately. I think it came out when I was a bookseller. So, you know, I know a bad book cover and that was not, it's a <laughs> very that, good I cover. I had very little, to, <laughs> yeah, it's a good cover. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I guess for me, I, I sort of started with like which artists I might be interested in, in working with, you know, like I think this came from when I was in bands for a long time, like usually when we were, looking for people, uh, looking for cover images, we would sort of think about whose art was sort of interesting and um, intriguing to us at the time um, with, you know, within reason <laughs> in terms of affordability. But uh, luckily, bigger budget with a publisher. So yeah, I mean, I had been a fan of Mary Gold Santos's work for a really long time. And I actually have like a few tattoos that she did for me. So, and I wanted my first book cover to be something like someone's art that felt uh, like a, like I was already connected to it in some way. So it was like really nice that she allowed us to use um, this like beautiful painting that she did, which was the, the two um, shrouded figures. It's from a series of uh, shrouded figures that she did. Um, and then uh, uh, Loki did the, did like figured out a way to incorporate it into a, into this design, which I really ended up 
liking a lot. I like it that it looks kind of like the figures are drowning. Um, and yeah, and I feel like it's like a slightly spooky, um, disturbing image in some ways. And, and some of my stories have that tone to them. So it fit that way as well. Um, I think like for my book, I, I worked with a, someone who was my roommate at the time who was an illustrator. Um, and so that worked out well, but um, I was going to say there is like kind of a nice thing about working within, we've all published with like independent small presses um, and having some more autonomy as authors over what your cover looks like and like having it kind of be part of the whole experience of reading the book. Um, because I've, I've known some writers who have, you know, been with bigger publishing outlets and then it's all just given to a marketing team and you get this weird graphic design cover that's like been tested and it's going to sell well because people like blue blotches or whatever it is mm -hmm. that kind of has nothing to do with whatever is inside the book. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's nice to see friends work put out with these like gorgeous covers that also feel like aesthetically related to the work inside. Yeah, like when I was working at the bookstore, I could tell which like because Sally Rooney was it was I think it, her I don't remember if it was her first or second book was getting really popular, and then all these covers started looking the same as hers. Um, and so you'd be like, oh yeah, everyone's trying to have the new Sally Rooney book. And I'd be like, there were like five covers that were like similarly colored and they were like always kind of like a, a swimming pool for some reason. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's funny. Um, well, for me, I have two books that came out within a similar amount of time within a, an, a year and I wanted my friend Lee to um do both of them and so they're like they kind of go well together and I didn't realize that this is truly the trans colors I feel very cliche but also great about it um I didn't plan that and then it happened um but yeah like I I with for, with my first one mainly kept like we it was like the beginning of the pandemic and we'd go on these pandemic walks by these train tracks and we talk about what I liked in book covers and I I have lots of aesthetic um, needs and opinions, but I don't know how to express them. So I can tell you if I like things or if I don't, but I don't know how to explain what, exactly what I like. So she was getting pretty frustrated with me and she was like, well, but like, what do you mean by that? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not the illustrator, you are. So we'd have to like, We'd like be going on these walks and her being like, what do you like? And I was like, oh, I really like this Denez Smith um, cover of, um, oh, what's the book called? I think it was like their first book. Oh, Insert Boy. And it's um, a, a painting that someone did of them at the front of the cover. And I had told Lee, oh, I don't want myself on the cover. And then this was like weeks before. And then um, she was like, well, what if we put you on the cover? And I was like, fine, <laughs> let's do it. And I actually really loved it. And then I was like, please do my next one, which, you know, then she did the good Arabs. And I had been wanting to showcase, um, kind of like intimacy between two men, uh, and the ways that that can be queer, but also just casual in Arab culture. Um, and then, so then I was working with Lee on the illustration and then we were working with Kevin Lowe from Low Key Design. Um, and he was like, what do you like? And I was like, I really like Ja Ching's book. <laughs> and he was like, what do you like about it? And I was like, it's just nice. <laughs> I, I like the way it is. And so then I was kind of trying to get him to do something like that. And then the book cover is very different because he was like, I don't know, like with this illustration, I don't know what you want me to do. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, you, you're the expert. So mostly working with great people is key. Sweet. <laughs> That's the trick. Great people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for folks, when they, they do get to see the cover, I don't, there's this really lovely detail where the hand comes out of the O, the one O and goes over to the other O. It's just, very 
gentle, suggestive, maybe loaded touch, you know, it's quite nice. Uh, sweet, that's exciting. Um, Kaysen, I heard a rumor at the beginning that you have a, another book in the works or coming. What's, uh, what's, yeah. what's up with that? What's happening? Um, I feel like um, it sort of, it feels like, um, yeah, talking about like a, a baby before it's arrived or something. I don't know. Mm. But, um, but so I'm a little, I'm a little um, cagey about it. But okay. I've been, um, the one essay that I read an excerpt from tonight, um, I had this newsletter project that I started in uh, September of 2019 and uh, wrote one a month until September 2020. Uh, and so now I've just kind of been working with those essays to build out a novel. And obviously, you know, March 2020 happened like sort of in the midst of um, when I was doing this project. So a narrative arc just kind of like came <laughs> out of real life, which was nice. And um, I let it didn't see happening um so yeah that's what i'm working on right now and it's weird to work on something about the not so uh distant past something that's still mm -hmm. like a a reality and a past that we're still currently reckoning with so there's a lot of thoughts and starts but you know look out for it maybe by 2030. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll keep an eye um and yeah where can we where can we keep eyes out where when I was going to keep, uh, where can we find out about the? <laughs> I'm I'm around on the internet. Um, okay. Yeah, Kason Sharp on Instagram or Twitter. I'm I'm taking Twitter hiatus, but I'll be back. And I I post, I'm around. <laughs> I'm around virtually. Amazing. <laughs> virtually. Um, Helen, uh, I had a question for you about your stories. Um, one of the things that I noticed as I was reading the book was how well these stories ended. Um, like I'm thinking about a lot about that third story, Sheila, the, the writing builds and builds and builds. And then it sort of, I don't want to give any spoilers, but when it ends it, I felt like I had like almost run past it and I had to turn around and be like, Oh, okay. I see. Um, and it just really grabbed me. And I was wondering, how do you decide when a, a story has come to a close? Like, especially with short fiction, it's, uh, you know, it's a real art. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks for saying that. I, I think that I often, uh, this sounds very cliche, I often like begin with the end in mind. Isn't that the title? Of, that's the title of something famous. Um, Should be. I often, like, I think that my, first of all, I think about stories for like months and months and months, if not years before I ever try to start writing them. So I like draft them many times in my head. And I think often the thing that I'm thinking around the most is like what the ending, like where I want the reader and, you know, the characters to be by the end. Um, and then a lot of the other work is like, um, well, kind of like that piece that Kason just read, like figuring out where the beginning is. Like if you know where you want to end up, if it's like geographically, physically, emotionally, whatever, where do you start it? And like, how do you like propel it there? Um, and there's like, yeah, I think that I use like movement a lot in stories often, like literally there's like a tour story and like a Camino story. And um, I think in a way I just like use that as like a propulsion method because I'm like, I know I need to like get over there, <laughs> but I have to start somewhere else. Otherwise the story won't be very interesting. Um, yeah, I think that's the best way I can explain it. Although I'm going to admit to you that the one that you just mentioned, Sheila, came from a writing workshop where like my writing instructor, um, who's really great, uh, um, it was Jennifer Tseng who kindly also gave me a little blurb. Um, and she sort of introduced me to the method of like taking someone like a very famous writer's story or a story that you really like. In this case, it was a, I think it was a Mercedes. No, it was a Nabokov story, I think. Um, and to just like kind of make a skeletal diagram almost of what you think the main, you know, seven steps of the story are. And then just like be very, very, 
anyway, and then use that scaffolding to write your own story. Okay. And it shouldn't be recognizable as the original, but um, I did, I think I wrote that story with like a Nabokov story scaffolding. So cool. I will credit him with that somehow. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good trick. It was a great uh, trick. Yeah. So, um, and then Eli, <laughs> looking to you now. Um, when I was reading your book, which I also really loved, something that stood out right away for me was how varied the pieces of writing were like there's the the piece like you just read um do you run when you hear a loud crack that's sort of longer and really pulls you into this you know whole scene and all, all the feelings and then there's i i don't read arabic but it's on page 13 and it's just one page um beautiful and really it just describes perfectly this one moment sitting uh, on a rock. Someone's sitting up on the rock and it's a, a hot day and the sun's coming down and um, it just pulls you right in the image. I, was, I read it many times. Um, and I'm wondering how you came to, to put all of these varied things together in, in one collection, which I think is quite cohesive. Um, yeah. Oh, that's nice to hear. I was hoping it would be cohesive. Um, <laughs> Cause yeah, I, I definitely was like, oh my God, there's all these bits and I, I, I want them all to be in here. Um, and I definitely had um, a lot more and just had to kind of uh, excavate or something. Um, but basically I started writing this project like six or seven years ago. Um, and like didn't know that it was going to end up being this project. I mostly started writing when I was in a creative writing program with Quezon um, at Concordia. And so I was kind of just writing poems. Um, and then they they started having thematic, well, you know, uh, a thematic like through line. Um, then I kept writing them and writing them. And uh, so I started off with with poems that are more, I guess, obvious as poems um, or more, uh, anyways, obvious works. Um, but so I started with that and then put it aside and then started working on my other book, Not Body, and then did that. And I feel like I learned a lot writing that, which was kind of also, um, many kinds of writing like there were letters in it and there's a lyric essay and then more um and poems and so i just got really interested in the ways that all these different forms can work together to um address a single subject or a single subject that kind of you can explode into um a bajillion things um and so i was yeah i was going through the good arabs and then um, I was like, I want to try writing a short story because I was really stuck with all the, I was stuck somewhere and I was like, I can't look at these poems anymore. I hate poetry right now, <laughs> um, which I don't still hate poetry. So that's nice. But I, I was like really stuck. So then I went to try to write a short story and was like, oh, this is quite hard. Why did I decide that I wanted to write a short story for the, you know, not the first time, but basically the first like time in years and then put in this book, but then um, had a lot of help from different people uh, who edited it, uh, including Helen. Um, and then I was like, oh, now I have these poems in a short story. And then I needed something, another thing. because so I was like, this still, now it feels like just two, two kinds of things. You know, there's some poems and there's a short story. And that's when I kind of got the idea of the conversations with Arabs. Um, and that kind of felt like it pulled everything together. Um, and I uh, got that idea from, once again, Helen, who uh, wrote a story called The Q, which is all in dialogue um, based on, uh, what's his name? Uh, Oh, uh, a different um, Russian. Yeah. Um, 
Vladimir uh, Sorokin. Ed Sorokin, <laughs> yeah. I was gonna call him Sorokov, like just mixing up Nabokov and Sorokin. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, I, I want to write poems and dialogue. So then tried that out. Basically, I'm a copycat. Um, and um, yeah, I think, and then, you know, I was working with like prose poetry, which I've always loved and other kinds of poetry and the guzzle, which I also love. Um, and like, basically I just, I love experimenting. I don't, I often feel frustrated if I'm stuck in like one kind of genre or place. And then I just did a, so much work in the editing to be like, how do I put these together and what makes sense? And like, did the whole like laying out my poems all over the ground and shuffling them about and being like, I hate this so much. Why did I decide to put a book together? And then finally it was like, okay, this seems good. And then sent it and I was like, hopefully it works. It definitely does. Oh, that's cool. That's cool, that's cool, that's cool. Um, okay, so I know there were questions, yeah. <laughs> Looking at some of the questions that we put together. Uh, and folks in the audience, if you have a question, you can also pop it in the Q and A. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I guess from that, from where we're at, um, what, is there like a piece of writing or a work or something that you've done that you feel really proud of that you're really stoked on? And you're like, this this was really great. Um, and maybe we can start with you, Kason. Yeah, I'm, I was thinking about that question earlier and like, it's hard because I've been, I've been, kind of going over everything that I've written before. And hindsight is an asshole sometimes. And like <laughs> you just immediately, I feel like a year after writing something, I'm like, I hate that. Um, so I think the thing that I'm most proud of is always the thing that I most recently wrote. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, then I write something new and I'm like, like I'm not a faithful lover in that way. I like, oh, I thought that was the best thing ever. Like really it's this <laughs> thing. Um, and so I've been writing a lot recently, like a lot of commissions for um, artists, which is like fun to do, like responding to exhibitions or writing text to a company work. Um, and I think I'm kind of most proud right now of like the work that I've made that responds, that is, that's a response in that way or like a collaboration with a different artist. It feels less like centered on myself. Uh, it feels like I'm making work like in conversation with someone or like through dialogue with someone, which is like a new kind of experience. And it's something that like gets me away from, um, you know, just sitting hunched over my computer, like dwelling over these people that don't exist that I'm creating or whatever. At least it feels like I'm like connecting to someone else or like we're building this thing together. And that to me is like a sense of pride. Um, yeah, I think I also just have to start sending my work out to more people because like when you start like Eli talking about Helen um, editing some of their work um, and like the three of us have like exchanged work before like in a writing group together and like that kind of collaborative practice is like produced more work that I'm proud of as opposed to the stuff that I work on on my own. Cool, yeah. Yeah, I love that answer quite a bit. Uh, Eli? Yeah. yeah, I also have a heart, like I was like, what, what is a piece of work that I feel the most proud of? And it's hard because I, I think I like think really in like big, like book project kind of ways. Um, and so like I often, it's not that like I forget about the pieces, but like often when I'm like preparing for a reading, I'll go through and I'll remember certain pieces and I'll be like oh yeah I really like that one and like often reading it out loud will remind me what I like for the most part um so I, it's I guess it's like often it's like oh I I love all my babies equally I will say but um sometimes it's like it's more about like which ones are the most fun to read like um I really like reading um a poem in the good Arabs called this is not a poem because it's really repetitive and um, it's like talking about like pork and and fat in your mouth and it's really like luxurious to read 
um, in like a both like really fun kind of gross way at the same time. Um, and like, I usually, I really like reading Nancy Ashram Made Me Gay, um, which is uh, according to Metonymy, a fan favorite, uh, has been dubbed a fan favorite. Um, mostly also because I get, like if there's a part at the beginning that I usually sing before reading and that's always really fun to do. Um, but yeah, there's nothing. And yeah, recently, like for my first book, um, I really started liking reading Not Body again, which is kind of uh, the biggest poem in that book that's like fairly performative and had and kind of pushed me out of my comfort zone when it comes to performing because I love performing, but it was like, I feel like that po poem I really have to perform. And the first time I did it, I was like, oh no, this was very bad. And no one like gets the vibe of the poem. And I really had to like do it many times before anyone was like, that was good. You know, usually they were like, well, whatever, <laughs> some words, but yeah. So that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh, Helen. Um, I like what you said, Kason, about like being an unfaithful lover to your works. Like, I think this always happens to me in whatever creative thing I'm doing. Like, I, I quickly become like embarrassed by things that I've created, you know, even if it was like um, two months ago. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think, I think I feel, I often feel the most excited about the things that I just have done. Um, so I, I actually also through a commission, got commissioned to write a story, which is rare, I think, or at least it's very rare for me. Um, and it's actually a story that will be um, part of a podcast series that is going to come out um, sometime a bit later this year, which I'm really excited about. So yeah, it's interesting. Like I'm, I've been writing this story, um, but then I think it will mostly, at least at the beginning, only be experienced in audio form. Um, but I, I love, I love reading out loud and I, I like sort of performing my work in that way. So I'm excited about that. And I'm like, really, I think part of what I like about it, and I also did show this to the writing group that all three of us are in that was mentioned earlier. Uh, and people sort of helped me feel that it wasn't, um, garbage. Um, and yeah, I'm like trying, I'm really like moving into a different prose style, I think, you know, I sort of feel like I did one thing or maybe a few different things in this short story collection, but I don't like to stick with the same thing for very long. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to like overhaul my, my prose style or something like, and I think it's working. I think it might be working, which is really exciting or like it, 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 seems to have worked okay in this particular piece. And I'm curious to see whether I can like continue in that direction. I, re I had to, I was like writing a grant application today and I had to go back into some older work that I'd been doing and it feels weird to me now because I've like been trying this new thing and it's weird to go and look at the old thing and try to evaluate, you know, try to edit it and send it in as a as a sample and stuff so who knows ask me again in two months and i'll tell you that this thing that i'm excited about is like the worst <laughs> <laughs> well best of luck overhauling your pro style mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and with the grant so, um we've got a question from the audience our studio live studio audience um esther uh is asking, is there a popular idea or myth about being a writer that you believed at some point, but no longer do? Uh, maybe that being a writer is cool. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, um, that it is like a cool thing to do. Um, yeah, I think I had this, this Joan Didion smoking at the in the corner of the party crying idea of a writer. Um, that then when I actually started down like started sitting down and writing more seriously or more like intentionally um those pretensions kind of faded away a bit um I feel like I still have an air sometimes I'm, I'm a writer but like mostly I feel like it's this weird dorky thing that I do in my room that I'm kind of like a bit embarrassed to talk about 
I like that crying alone in a party, smoking in a corner. You were like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that's, yeah, that guy. Because <laughs> I totally relate to that. Um, <laughs> Eli, Helen, what do you got? Um, I think, I think I, I used to probably have this idea that writers were, yeah, maybe crying, maybe smoking, um, but like really alone, you know, like alone, room of one's own, like really sitting alone in a garret. Maybe there's one window and they're just like scrawling away and like they don't talk to anybody. And, and um, like it's been mentioned, earlier this evening, like, I think I've found, fortunately, um, that it's much, it, it is, and it can be like much more collaborative than that. And I think often my writing is a lot richer for any collaboration that I'm able to do on various levels. And I think it's something that isn't as visible, um, you know, especially when you're younger, like thinking about authors and stuff, um, the like group process of writing that, that exists. Very cool. Mm, you stole my answer. Um, so I'll try to find a different answer. Um, oh no, I also had a different answer. Now I forget it. Uh, I'm trying to think about like myths of, of writers and what people think other than being like a lone figure who's like, I'm like, writers are depressed. That still feels accurate. Um, writers are often mad at their own work. That feels accurate. Um, writers are hot and sad and smoking. That feels accurate sometimes. <laughs> um, hmm. I guess I had like an idea of like writing as um, like I think I thought like there was like some kind of fame in writing or something like thinking of like famous writers and then you know projecting myself into the future as like someone who's gonna get like fame and fortune um because I also wanted as a kid I also wanted to be a famous musician so I had all these like I was like oh yeah I'm gonna be looked at by people um and like I'll want that and all that whereas now I'm like nah, I don't actually like I would hate to be like a famous writer like a a really famous writer it sounds awful maybe that's the myth that I actually would want that I'm like as long as I can like you know survive and like you know maybe a little thriving um could happen you know more grant money than I thought I would get <laughs> that would be nice um and that yeah I guess that's that's the myth that I it's like my own myth of my own self in the future <laughs> Um, I, I am out of questions that feel fair to ask right now. I won't ask you about the best book to give to a loud upstairs neighbor or the fictional character that you want to have a one night stand or do a choreographed dance with. Although I will be curious about those for a very long time. Wait, will um, you tell us? Will you tell us those? Do you have answers? Yeah, what are your answers? Um, Fictional character I, I would do a choreographed answer to probably Garrick on Deep Space Nine. I think he would be a wonderful dancer. <laughs> um, those of you who have not watched that, uh, it's worth it. 100%. Now I will. <laughs> Start to finish, I stand by it. Um, and I don't know what book to give my two loud upstairs neighbors, but I have two loud upstairs neighbors. So if anyone even in the audience is like, I know what book to give them. Please do let me know. I, oh, so I this was a crowdsource question. Yes, yeah, <laughs> I, I did think about this one, and my suggestion was Party Monster by James St. James. <laughs> a cautionary tale. <laughs> yeah, cautionary tale. Like, don't don't be too crazy. You might get into some trouble. <laughs> I mean, if they're not scared of the transsexual that lives below them and listens to metal at six in the morning, they will be. <laughs> Wait, are you the loud neighbor or are they the loud neighbor? Yeah, true. <laughs> it comes in and I send it back out. Um, yeah. <laughs> Enough about my home life. Um, 
My lab neighbors are kids, so oh. I wouldn't call them party monster. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did either any of you see the movie version with Macaulay Culkin? It was like it's compelled and disturbed. Yeah. It's hard to watch because it's Kevin McAllister. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, but one of the people who like filmed all of that whole crew like in the 90s all of that person's like old camcorder videos are on youtube oh. and i want i like to watch those which i mean can be a little disturbing if you think <laughs> about what ended up happening what ended up, yeah. yeah but they're on youtube there's like out there's sorry like, to take us to a place of party monster <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how do we thinking. jump out of party monster how do we jump out of party monster uh, i mean i don't know i think we just keep on coming back to you know um <laughs> back to party i monster. think with the one night stand question um eli and i have just been reading uh, samuel delaney's dalgren because i mm -hmm. <laughs> chose to to do it for my next um strange futures specific book club um and so there's a lot of like, there's a lot of sex, there's a lot of sex in the book, maybe a little less uh, gay sex than we were hoping for, TBH. Hope that's not a spoiler for people. <laughs> but when I was thinking about like casual sex, I was like, you know, probably one of the people from, from that book, they're all pretty like, you know, free and easy about sex. Seems like it wouldn't be a big deal. Um... <laughs> it's a very pragmatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's but, yeah. Do you all think I normally, <laughs> sorry go ahead oh mine's like a follow-up question so i was gonna ask if you all think about characters as like like do you think about them in that way where you're like oh well, like this is someone i would sleep with or this is someone who i would throw off a building or this is someone who i would have coffee with do you like imagine characters that way or are they just contained to the book for you I don't think I normally imagine them that way. I guess it depends what world they exist in. Like if they exist in a world that's sort of adjacent to my, like Helen, I've been, I got a copy of Personal Attention Roleplay and I've been reading it and loving it. Um, and like those characters are, especially was the characters who exist in Montreal and I think the characters who exist in Toronto are like, they're people I know and like feel very familiar with. And so I can see myself existing in that universe, like within their kind of general web, like when they're at the queer bar talking about whatever, like, you know, I'm at the table with my beer or whatever, I can see myself there. Um, but, you know, with something like Dalgren, it's like, it's a bit harder to imagine myself there uh, because it is a world that is very different from my world. Yeah, I, I don't think I usually would think about characters that way. Although I will say in the, the story Only the Lonely in your new collection, Helen, I was like, oh, well, this is very Montreal. And I remembered being in a Roy Orbison cover band in Montreal with you when I was reading this story. I was like, wow, OK. Um, That's so amazing. Was, yeah, a number of oh. things. I can picture this happening. Um, and I was just thinking of something else. I think that in, in The Fox Turns a Thousand by um, well, I'm blanking on her name right now. How did that happen? Clarissa Lai, my brain. Um, I remember when I was reading that, I was like, oh, I think I would date this fox. Although the fox is really dangerous, but also makes chickens. Anyway, hard, hard not to love. Uh, yeah. um, so thank you so much for reading and coming. And these books are beautiful and fun to read. And we're gonna keep an eye out for Kaysen's book in 2030. We got, what is that? Seven years and about 10 <laughs> months, give or take, uh, to wait, seven years. Yeah, my math is okay. Um, yeah, and I was really lovely to hear you all read. I was pretty excited about this. Yeah, cool. Um, all of the books are available at another story, another story.ca. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't see any questions here. Yeah. So I will pass it.
back over to Ashley. Thanks for patching us in. Good night. Thank you, Helen, Kaysan, Jaching, and Eli. Um, lovely readings, fantastic discussion. Um, I feel like I've been hanging out with you all for the evening. It does not, it's like a, not the same as IRL, but it's really nice to spend time <laughs> with you all regardless. And thanks again to everyone who attended, um, to another story for co-presenting with us and to Kay for captioning the event. Um, like I said, we did live stream to Facebook. If people missed part of it and want to take a look later, um, we may also post the recording uh, elsewhere for people to find. Um, so yeah, check out the books. Um, we hope to do more live events one day in the future. But in the meantime, it's, uh, I'm really glad we could make this happen and I really appreciate everyone's everyone's readings and everyone's contributions to the evening. So take care and uh, stay as safe as you can. Bye.